Rashid, uh, aside from his academic work, was also an advisor to the Palestinian delegation to the Madrid and Washington Arab-Israeli peace negotiations from 1991 to 1993, an experience that he discussed last night and that her, he'll perhaps touch on today. Rashid is the editor of the Journal of Palestine Studies, and he is a former president of the Middle East Studies Association, MESA. Next, we will hear from our very own Micheline Ishai, who's a professor here at DU's Joseph Corbell School of International Studies, and also, we're proud to say, an affiliate faculty member of our Center for Middle East Studies. Micheline's many books include The History of Human Rights, From Ancient Times to the Globalization Era, The Human Rights Reader, Major Political Essays, Speeches, and Documents from the Bible to the Present, Internationalism and Its Betrayal, and The Nationalism Reader. She is currently working on a book about the Arab Spring and its aftermath. And after Micheline, we'll hear from Tom Ferrer, who is university professor and, of course, former dean of DU's Joseph Corbell School of International Studies. He's also the former president of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights of the Organization of American States, the OAS. He's also the former president of the University of New Mexico, as well as the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs. Tom has served as special assistant to the general counsel of the US Department of Defense and to the assistant secretary of state for inter-American affairs. In 1993, he served as legal consultant to the United Nations operation in Somalia. In 1994 and 95, he assisted in Uganda's constitutional revision process. His most recent book is Confronting Global Terrorism and American Neoconservatism, the framework of a liberal grand strategy. I should also mention uh, in a gesture of shameless self-promotion that Tom is also a contributor to The Syria Dilemma, a book co-edited by myself and Nader Hashemi, the director of our Center for Middle East Studies. Now, just a quick word about the format. First, we'll hear from Rashid Khalidi, who will speak for approximately 15 to 20 minutes. Um, we will then hear from Micheline and Tom, who will each speak for approximately 12 to 13 minutes. Rashid will then have an opportunity to respond, if he so desires, to what Micheline and Tom have said. And then we will turn it over to you for questions and answers. So without any further ado, let's all welcome Rashid Khalidi to our school. Um, I'm going to have to get this mic way down. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Nada, for inviting me, Danny. Thanks to everybody who made this event possible. Um, I talked last night uh, for a, almost an hour about this book. And I know some of you were there and some of you weren't there. Uh, uh, so I'm not going to recapitulate what I said yesterday. It would be hard to do it in 20 minutes anyway. Uh, what I will do instead is talk about the genesis of this book, how I came to write it, and a little bit about it. And then uh, I will leave it to Professor Ishai and Professor Ferrer to uh, comment on it. And then in my, maybe in my response to their comments, I'll say a little more about the book. Um, this is one of two books that I have written trying to do so as a historian about events that I was directly involved in. Um, the first was a book called Under Siege, PLO Decision Making During the 1982 War, which is about the decisions that the PLO took in leaving Beirut uh, at the end of the summer of 1982. And I was privy to some of the communications that are reported in that book. And during the war, I was talking to somebody who was involved. And I said, you know, if we get out of this, I have the ambition one day to write some of this stuff up, because I think this is an interesting story. And he said, well, if we all survive, then you know, maybe we'll let you look at these documents. And they survived. The documents survived. And I wrote the book, partly based on interviews with participants, American, French, Israeli, and other participants, and especially Palestinian participants, but also based on the documents uh, that, I, that, I had, that I was given access to. Um, 
And that book has been translated into Arabic and Hebrew and French and a bunch of other languages. It's about to be published again in a second edition with a new introduction, which talks about some new documentary revelations uh, from the Israel State Archives about the 82 war and about not so much PLO decisions, but other decisions. Um, so that was the first book that I wrote that had this character. It was an attempt to look at a body of documents, to look at uh, uh, what you might call old-fashioned diplomatic history of something that I myself had been in, in some way peripherally involved. Um, I had a second opportunity to do this. Uh, as a result of my coincidental involvement in the 91 to 93 Palestinian-Israeli peace negotiations that started at Madrid and continued through 10 rounds in Washington. Um, I was minding my own business in Jerusalem, working on Palestinian identity uh, in uh, 1991, and going to talk to members of Palestinian, of Jerusalem families that had private papers and libraries. And I went to see a member of the Husseini family. I went to see Faisal Husseini, Abu Abid. And I said to him, do you have any papers? He said, no, I don't have any papers, but my cousin so-and-so and my cousin so-and-so do. He said, but by the way, there is a possibility that the Palestinians are going to be invited to a peace conference. And at that point, I stopped him. And I said, Faisal, you know perfectly well that the Shamir government is never going to allow the Palestinians to participate in any peace negotiations. He said, well, I know why you say that, but Secretary Baker is trying to make this possible. And we would like you to be an advisor to the delegation. I said, even if they let you go to the, or somebody go, they're not going to let me go because they're going to insist that this and that and the other kind of person can't be there. They'll only want residents of the territories. Um, he said, well, the United States is going to try and see to it that people from the diaspora, people from outside who might not be acceptable to the Israelis can serve as advisors. Would you do so? And I said, yeah, sure. You know, I thought that the chances of this happening were nil, and I forgot about it until I got a phone call months later in Chicago asking me immediately to send some of my information to the State Department so that it could be processed so that I could go to Madrid. And I, I did go to Madrid, and I served throughout that two years of negotiations as an advisor, one of several advisors to the Palestinian delegation that negotiated with uh, uh, an Israeli uh, delegation under Yakim Rubinstein, who's now a judge of the Israeli Supreme Court, um, without success. Uh, we were not involved in the negotiations that ultimately led to the Oslo Accords. We failed to reach an agreement with the Israelis. But in so doing, I accumulated a collection of documents, which included every document that the Palestinian side prepared or presented all of the documents that the Israeli side presented to us, and all of the records of our conversations with both American and Israeli diplomats. And as a historian, I said, I mean, this is a treasure trove. I want to do something with it. And I never had the opportunity to do it. In fact, I couldn't figure out what to do with it, because this was a failed negotiation. It was like a part of a much longer story. How do I, how do I tell this story? How, what's the entry? What's the, what's the entry point for it? And it wasn't until a very bright student of mine who's finishing his PhD now at Columbia started showing me the materials he was coming upon from the Carter and Reagan administration about US policy on Palestine that the light went off in my head and I said, bingo, I've got it. I'm going to write this not as a story of these negotiations. I'm going to write this as one of three moments which illuminate the basic realities of American policy on Palestine. This is not going to be about the Palestinians. It's not going to be about Israel. It's not even going to be about the negotiations per se or the negotiations I was involved in. It was going to use those negotiations, the material that is now being declassified in the Israel State Archives and in our government's archives, plus what all of us could see going on with President Obama to tell some bait, what I thought were some basic truths about uh, how the United States makes its policy on Palestine and what that policy is. And that's what this book is an attempt to do. It's an attempt to show, firstly, that the United States on policy on Palestine is quite different from American policy in the Middle East as a whole. So if you look at the book, the title is, can I just have the book for a sec? The title is Brokers of Deceit, subtitle, How the U.S. Has Undermined Peace in the Middle East. Well, actually, one of the things that I show in this book is that the United States has undermined peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis but where its national interests dictated that it do things to defuse major aspects of the Middle East conflict, it has done so, and done so effectively, and done so in ways that have ridden roughshod over either the Israel lobby or the preferences of a whole series of Israeli governments. What I show in this book is that Palestine is actually different. And these instances, the, 
the, the stuff that one of my students, his name is Seth Ansiska, and you should watch out for him. He's going to publish a dynamite book on the results of his research about the Carter and the Reagan administration. That episode, which I deal with in one chapter, the episode I was involved with, and then the Oslo talks that followed, and President Obama's attempts to move this issue off square one in his first <coughs> term are the three uh, moments that I talk about. So the first thing I show in this book is that uh, American policy has not just not furthered peace on the Palestine issue. It has actually exacerbated this conflict and made it worse. Uh, even though the United States helped to bring about a peace between Egypt and Israel, even though the United States was involved in bringing a, about peace between uh, Jordan and Israel, even though it diffused major conflicts in the Arab-Israeli arena at different times from the 67 war and even going back to the 56 war uh, until today. On this issue, its policy has been wholly pernicious. It has neither served the interests of peace nor has it served the interests of the peoples involved, as I see those interests. Uh, obviously, that's my view. Um, something else that I argue in this book and that I, I came up with myself but was truly, I mean, it was amplified in an important way by the observations of people who read earlier drafts are that this is not just a matter of, you know, the positions that countries take or the Palestinians or the Israelis or whatever. It's also a matter of language and discourse and the terms in which things are put. Uh, legal language, uh, public relations language, uh, language that is common in our culture. Uh, in, my, in my view, using uh, an argument from George Orwell, which I quote as the epigraph to the introduction to the book, is often, in this case in particular, debased and dishonest and it corrupts the way we think about this. And I argue that a perfect example of this is something that for over 30 years has been called a peace process. Well, what has happened in the 35 years since the Camp David Accords? What has happened in the 22 years since, the, um, uh, since we all went to Madrid in October of uh, 1991? What has happened since the Oslo Accords were signed in 1993? Um, well, I would argue that Peace has not been the outcome. I, I won't argue that. Any moron can see that peace is not the outcome. There's Egyptian-Israeli peace. There's Jordanian-Israeli peace. But between the Palestinians and the Israelis, things are not just not better. They are significantly worse, if you understand the, uh, a resolution of the conflict as meaning people feel secure. There's a final, just, a permanent solution that's sustainable. These things haven't happened. Uh, when we went to Madrid, uh, there were uh, a little less than 200,000 Israeli settlers in the occupied territories. There are 650,000 of them now. One in 10 Jewish Israelis live in the West Bank in Gaza. Uh, sorry, the West Bank in, none of them live in Gaza, the West Bank in East Jerusalem. How you get an Israeli government to ignore one-tenth of the voters is beyond me. Uh, in any democratic system, ignoring one-tenth of the voters is political suicide. And that's the situation today. That was not the situation in 1991. Even less was it the situation in 1978. Uh, at the time of the Camp David Accords. There are many other changes that have taken place. As far as my understanding of any kind of just, lasting, sustainable peace, as far as my understanding of the situation of the Palestinians is, is concerned, as far as most Palestinians' understanding of their own situation is concerned, their position today is immeasurably worse than it was 22 or 35 years ago. This is not a process that has produced peace. The people who talk about it in this, in this sense are using dishonest language. This is a process. But uh, in the book, I quote President Nixon uh, as talking about basically having to push the, kick the can down the road. Even if we're not solving it, we have to have a process. And I, I would argue that's what the United States has done in this, in, in this instance. Where other issues are concerned that involve what are perceived by people in Washington as major American strategic in, interests, the United States has been decisive. And the United States has acted, whether for good or for ill, uh, without restraints, whether from Israel or from any lobby. Uh, 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 and and, and, and uh, by contrast, I argue in this book, where Palestine is concerned, that has simply not been the case. I don't think American policy responds to the interests of peace. I don't think it responds to the true interests of the peoples involved. How Israel is better off for having 650,000 of its Jewish citizens living on Arab land uh, against the wishes of the Palestinians is beyond me. But that is a policy that has been aided and abetted by a whole series of things that we have done. We give Israel billions of dollars in military aid annually, which sustains the occupation, sustains the settlements. Hundreds of thousands of dollars of tax-free 
donations from charitable 501c3s flow directly to the settlement enterprise with the complete unconcern, apparently, of our Treasury or of our Justice Department. These are violations of international law. These are actions in opposition to American policy. And we pay higher taxes because other people are making these charitable donations that support the settlement enterprise. We are funding the settlements by our taxes going to the government, where other people's taxes are instead going to Efrat or Ma'ari Adomim or, or Ariel uh, or Gush Etzion. Um, and there are many other ways in which we are actually aiding and abetting actively our country, our government, our policies, our taxes, are aiding and abetting policies that, to my way of thinking and the way of thinking of many Israelis, uh, are not in the interest of Israel, are certainly not in the interest of the Palestinians. Uh, and yet our president and our presidents over six administrations, our secretaries of state, our national security advisors, have blandly used the term peace process, have blandly used a whole variety of other terms, autonomy, self-determination, independence, while at the same time acting in ways that guarantee that there cannot be Palestinian independence, that guarantee there cannot be Palestinian self-determination. Uh, uh, and guarantee that, in fact, the autonomy that they're talking about uh, is one in which the Palestinians are deprived of control over almost every important decision. If you're born in the West Bank or Gaza Strip, uh, you don't enter into a Palestinian population register. The Israelis have to approve your entry into that register. You don't get identity papers unless you're approved. You can't come in and marry somebody and then get nationality unless the Israelis approve. Entry, exit, population statistics, everything exports, imports. Movement is under control of the occupying power. That's not autonomy. And that's the regime that's been in place for 20 years. It's actually worse today than it was when we went to Madrid 22 years ago. It's considerably worse. Freedom of movement is worse. Uh, uh, the difficulties uh, of getting uh, in and out are infinitely worse. So the argument that I make in this book is very simply that the language that is being used around this, up to and including the language that Secretary Kerry and the President are using for this latest initiative, is deceitful. It's not honest. Uh, and that this approach cannot produce a resolution that um, will be just and sustainable. Uh, very simply put, we are operating on the basis of a blueprint that was laid down back at Camp David in 1978 by Menachem Begin. Um, and I have the handwritten notes by Begin that one of my students discovered in the Israel State Archives to prove it. If you read what Begin said, I insist that the outcome include these things. And you see the outcome 35 years ago. He got absolutely and exactly every single thing he wanted, with one minor exception. That is the blueprint of the Oslo Accords. It's not an American blueprint. It's not an Israeli Labor Party blueprint. It's certainly not a Palestinian blueprint. It's not an international blueprint. It is a blueprint of the architect of Israel's settlement and occupation policy from the 70s onwards, uh, one of the you know, leading figures uh, in Zionism and in Israel, uh, uh, one of the leading prime ministers of Israel. That is what we are operating on the basis of today. And it's that system uh, that is being tweaked rather than people saying, let's start from the beginning, which is what I would argue we should be doing. Let us put aside this whole failed experiment Let's begin a negotiation on the basis of international law. Let us begin a negotiation with intermediaries that are actually honest brokers rather than intimately linked to one of the parties. Uh, let us see to it that the outcome uh, takes into account not just the changes that have taken place over the past 65 or, or 46 years since 1948 or since 1967 or since Oslo, uh, but also take into, it takes into account the requirements of justice. Uh, and, 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 and sustainability. And finally, let us talk about a settlement that doesn't just include the people in the occupied territories. There are over one and a half million people who identify as Palestinians who are citizens of the state of Israel. That settlement has to encompass their interests and their position within Israel. The majority of Palestinians do not live either in Israel or in Gaza or in the West Bank or in Jerusalem. All of those Palestinians put together are a minority of the entire Palestinian people. The majority of Palestinian people live outside of Palestine, whether in Jordan or Syria or Lebanon or much farther afield. There are a quarter of a million of them in Chile. Okay, now maybe some of these people will never want to come back to Palestine. The point is they see themselves as Palestinians. Some of them have rights insofar as property is concerned. 
Some of them have rights insofar as the United Nations has laid it down for refugees that they have certain rights, whether of return or other things. If these things are not taken into account fairly in a settlement, it will not be a just or a sustainable settlement. People in Washington say, we want to do what's practical and what's pragmatic. We don't really care about justice here. We just want to do what's, what can be done, what's feasible within the political dynamics, within the ceiling. Well, they have a ceiling that's down here as far as this issue is concerned. That's the ceiling under which we were forced to operate for two years in Washington. That's not a ceiling that's going to produce a settlement that will last. You can't do something that is going to be imposed on the Israelis, but you also can't do something that's going to be imposed on the Palestinians. And pretty much everything that the United States has done since 1978 has been trying to impose things on the Palestinians. That has not worked, will not work, cannot work. And that's one reason we haven't, the United States hasn't brought about a settlement. So that's the essential argument of the book. I've gone over 15 minutes. Um, I'll let Micheline and Tom uh, 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 have a say about, about the book. Thank you very much. Extra five minutes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Nada Hashemi and uh, Danny Postel and Doug for organizing this. I think you are doing a great job bringing interesting people in uh, at Corbell uh, School. So I uh, keep doing the great job that you've been doing so so far. I had the privilege to sit yesterday at uh, the talk of uh, Rashid Khalidi. And uh, I want to say this very interesting conversations uh, for over an hour in which he explained the thesis of his book. I, he repeated, I think you repeated it, some of it today, so I won't go through the all uh, details of your arguments. Let me just grab my water, Michelin, excuse me. Sorry. This book, uh, I want to say, is a very well argued, very well written book, very worth reading. So anything that comes after that, please remember that sentence. And when you buy the book, remember, I take commission. So, <laughs> so what I would like to suggest is that it is very good, but I will have some, uh, some disagreements with respect to the book as well. Otherwise, I wouldn't be a commentator. So. Uh, what the thesis of the book is, is about really an effort to debunk a myth that, that the United States has been a honest broker between Israeli and Palestinians. Uh, I don't think that I or don't know many people, and judging from the face of the, in the audience, that anyone would really question the thesis. It seems to me that it's quite obvious that, that the United States has privileged its relationship with the United States for a very long time, and certainly since 78. What I would like to question is a couple of things. And I will just go through some of your moments, which, you, which are the moments that uh, enable you to corroborate your thesis. So for instance, you, um, uh, one of those moments that you are bringing up is, is trying to suggest that the first moment in which uh, American and Israeli um, and Egyptians came together in Camp David was in order actually to set the framework of what you call the Middle, East, uh, Middle Eastern process, and that Begin, in fact, laid down all the principles that would be consistent through various administrations until today. Uh, I can't help thinking that somewhat this argument seems a bit deterministic. Um, it's, it it's almost seems that there has been no room uh, for maneuvering. It almost seems that as you're making the rest of the narrative as a description of in inevitable events. So your book has the feel of a, a sort of a consequentialist approach to how history unfold. Um, rather than, forgive my theoretical here, infusions, but rather than a Weberian or sort of a Marxist approach of history, which will always ask at every given point in time, what if it had happened differently? Or what are the contradictions that were presented at a given historical time that could actually made, provide the space for some difference and change? So I don't see much of that in the book. And, and so uh, and as we go really from the first moment, you really set almost in stone um, this argument that Begin had about uh, no no independence for the Palestinians, no divisions of, Israel, of Jerusalem, no uh, return for Palestinian refugee, and there would be never room for maneuver. I think that 
with respect to the honest brokership of the United States, one can at least say that they were not really Palestinians representative uh, at the time of Camp David. If anything, uh, the only representative was the PLO, and the PLO, uh, there was some, almost like a discordance between what the PLO was doing, committed to violent uh, activities against uh, Israelis, civilians, and Jewish, generally speaking, throughout the 1970s. And also the PLO was, when asked to join uh, and participate in, um, uh, uh, in future negotiations, simply refused. In fact, I have recently read again uh, an interview from uh, certainly a friend of yours, Edward Said, in which he reminded us that uh, what had happened uh, during that period was that um, Cyrus Vance had asked him you probably know, but I would just say that for the sake of the audience, to the audience, Cyrus Vance asked him to deliver a message uh, to Arafat in which the United States offered the PLO to be recognized. And what Arafat said, responding to Edouard Said, he said it was not interested whatsoever. And I can quote Said uh, on this. He said, Arafat replied, we don't want the Americans. The Americans have stabbed us in the back. This is a lousy deal. We want Palestine. We don't want to negotiate with the Israeli. We are going to fight. Um, in the same Z Magazine interviews, Said concluded, and I quote his word, there were many such deals that went on through the 1980s as Arafat got weaker and weaker. Arafat had no troop to command. It was clear to me at any rate in the 1970s that we had no military option against Israel any more than they had against us. But Arafat turned it down. Those are the words of Edward Said. So I just want to suggest here there, were, there was a problem of inviting the Palestinians at the table precisely because there was also a lack of interest from the PLO to join the table of negotiations as early as uh, the, 1970, uh, the 1978 or 79 onward. Uh, with respect to the second point, uh, and I have to pay attention to time. With so respect to the second point, uh, you discuss about 1991 and 1993, and, and of course I understand why you were part, you were participants of the negotiations of Madrid, and also um, uh, influential in, in those negotiations. But it seems to me that when we talk about moments that had real influence, I, I don't see that Madrid was the most important one. It was certainly important in the sense that the first intifada, the change of the Cold War, has created new conditions for the Israeli to really make new concessions. And so many people were ready to, to sit around an international table and just discuss about what are the type of new concessions that, Palestine, we can, that can be provided to the Palestinians. But truly, the point, it seems to me, that was a game changer in the whole story and the genesis and the journey, journey of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was two things. One was Camp David, uh, which you, you talk a little bit about in your book. You mean 78 or, uh, or Camp David two, 2000? 2000. Uh, this was a game changer for two reasons. Of course, Barak did not succeed in providing a peace agreement. The Israeli never forgave him for that. And then what we saw coming as a result of that was the, the beginning of a second intifada with rounds of violence, which actually created a completely different uh, directions so as to way, the way uh, the rest of public opinion, certainly in Israel, would see and engage the Palestinians. So I'm just moving forward very fast. So I, I don't want to quibble about the long conversations about whether Dennis Ross was correct in his assessment of Camp Davy II or not. This is something that they put on the side for now. But I think that it had a major impact as to the way Israeli government will be thinking about these issues, Israeli people. And from then on, what we will have is a continuous a sort of a series of Likud governments taking, um, to assuming power. So when we talk about honest brokerships, at your third point, right, mm -hmm. uh, in history, we are talking about an Obama which really will really inherit a very difficult conditions has to deal with the liquid governments on the one hand, and on the other hand, will have to deal with the Palestinians who have been more fractured than ever as a result of the 2006 feuds between uh, Fatah and Hamas, 
And that has created a very difficult position when you're a broker. However good you are and however disinterested you are, I mean, in fairness, I'm not usually making sort of a, an apology for US foreign policy, but in fairness, you have sort of on the one hand that is really bullied sort of with, with uh, Bibi Netanyahu, and on the other hand, you have a completely another child that cannot get his act together, and here's the parent who's trying to make the deal, very tough to make a deal in those circumstances. So I just want to bring that to your attention. Uh, I'm sure you know about that, but uh, sort of as another way of thinking about this uh, stringent uh, view about the United States unilateral position toward Israel. So, uh, two words. I, I really like the fact that you speak about the responsibility of Arab states as being very deceitful and misleading. Uh, they've never been a very good lawyers for the Palestinians. In fact, I would, I would even submit that bad lawyers uh, produce worse outcome. And uh, you've explained that very well yesterday from uh, the Saudi uh, to Lebanese and others who have not really done the share and even just paid lip service to the Palestinian cause. Okay. So, try. <laughs> okay. so my question now, and it's almost like a question that maybe you can develop in the question and answers, read what is next? Uh, you said yesterday in your, in your talk, the first time is a farce, mm -hmm. the second time is a tragedy. There must be a third time because <laughs> you have a third period. So what is the third time? Um, you really end your book on a very, very pessimistic note. You really don't give many hopes to that generation in front of us. And I just really don't want that to happen. I so your concerns cannot be dismissed. With what cannot be dismissed? Your concerns ah. cannot be dismissed. Clearly, we have over 40 years of occupations and settlement which come close to severing the West Bank. The prospect for a viable, a two-state solution seems grimmer than ever. I agree. But that means that we should also be looking for contradiction. That's what I was trying to say in the beginning, that would open space for change. And there are some interesting contradictions, and I don't know how well I will do it, but developing them in, in the two minutes, the three minutes are left. Uh, for me, but to me. So let me just talk about one. The context is interesting. Everybody thinks that, in fact, one of the contradictions is between the turmoil in the Arab world and the relative confidence that, that inside Israel as a result of that. The aftermath of the Arab uprising, and particularly, especially the coup in Egypt, has calmed Israeli fear for the first time that the contagions of 2011 will spill over Israeli border. For the first time, Arab authoritarian rulers have been too preoccupied with their own domestic uprising to focus on the Palestinian question. This has seemed at first tragic for the Palestinian, but at the same time, it reduces Israeli fear about their own destruction. However exaggerated that perception may well be, it is there, right? So I believe that it's easier to make concession from a position of strength. The Israeli feel today stronger, for sure, to tackle the Palestinian problem, which will not go away very soon. It's actually going to get worse, as you already pointed out. A second contradiction that seems to be of interest, as one to want to see is opportunity, is the one that you highlighted also in your lecture today, is it between the settlements on the one hand and Israeli democracy. You're right, there are over 600,000 settlers. Uh, in the West Bank, and those settlers cannot easily be absorbed in the pre-1967 border. And so the expansions of settlement in the West Bank has severely damaged all prospects for a viable Palestinian state. And yes, to return to your pizza analogy of yesterday, I like really that pizza analogy, it is absurd to pretend that we can negotiate the divisions of the pie while you continue to eat the pizza. It's, it's, you were right, it's perfect. However, the West Bank is sort of an illegal limbo uh, from an Israeli perspective. As occupier, Israel, you said it yesterday, you're so correct about that, as obligation under international law, as you mentioned yesterday, and Palestinians need to learn how to claim their existing legal right more effectively, even under that condition. I, I don't think that happens often. Yesterday, I was so happy that you brought up the Geneva Convention, Geneva Convention and I think that Article 46, the, 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 uh, Provision 12 of uh, Article 46, suggests very clearly that it established a general concept in international law that any alteration to property by the occupier must not have permanent effect, 
permanent effect and must not be taken to the detriment of the local population. Uh, so this is with respect to private property. But there are a, a long list of human rights that the Palestinians should actually focus upon as individual rights rather than collective rights. Because when we listen and understand the notions of collective right, uh, and we associated it as the fight for self-determinations, here I think that Palestinians strategically have missed quite a bit. Um, do I have time for my third? No? Not yet. Not uh, yet. Maybe in the, in the next okay. session. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Michelle. Okay, so thank you. I love to comment on a book I despise. It's, it's so much easier. You, know, you sharpen your teeth and you rip into it. You have a delightful time. Uh, it's much harder to comment on a book you like, you even admire. And I do, I do like and admire uh, Professor Halidi's book. And therefore, I could simply say congratulations and sit down. <laughs> but you know, academics are driven by a variation of the Cartesian epigram. You know, Descartes said, I think, therefore, I am. Academics are moved by the epigram, I speak, therefore, I am. <laughs> so, uh, I'm just going to quibble a little bit, and just as part of the conversation. And I want to quibble a little bit about the title. And here you'll see a little distance between Michelin and myself. Has there been deceit? Well, it depends what audience perhaps you're speaking to. If you're speaking to people who know something about the Middle East, I would say, on the Israeli side, or the Zionist side, Zionism ultimately crystallizing in the Israeli state, no, no, there hasn't, there hasn't been. After all, Zionism was one of the nationalisms that emerged in the second half of the 19th century, like Italian, German, Serbian, Magyar. You're, this was the insurgent discourse of the second half of the 19th century. And in each case, it involved, they were led by intellectuals, a group of people who wanted to establish mastery over a particular piece of territory. It wasn't, they want, didn't want to establish a, a haven, a, a place of security. They wanted to be masters of a particular piece of territory. And that was as true of Zionism as it was true of all of these other these other nationalisms. And I don't say that critically, I just say it as, a, as an historical, a f as historical fact. There were no illusions among the intellectuals who, who developed Zionism that Palestine was a land without a people. They knew perfectly well there were a people there. As the intellectual godfather of the Likud government, Vladimir Jabotinsky said in 1937, the Arabs' instinctive patriotism is just as pure and noble as our own. It cannot be bought, it can only be cured by force. And then he went on to say, Zionist colonization must either stop or else proceed, regardless of the native population, which means that it can proceed and develop only under the protection of a power that is independent of the native population behind an iron wall. That is our Arab policy, whether we admit it or not. Uh, the rather hawkish Israeli historian who's written, I think, quite brilliantly about Israel and Palestine, that is Benny Morris, and an advisor to Ehud Barak, and summing up Jabotinsky, said he had no problem recognizing 
that Zionism had a legitimate rival in the Palestinian Arab nationalist movement. Hence, the Jews would have to settle and spread throughout Palestine and eventually dominate the country by force. Uh, in 1947, when David Ben-Gurion ben proclaimed the independence of the Israeli state, he ruefully declared in his, to his constituents that this is the best we can do at this time. He did not say we aspire to live in peace with a Palestinian state when it is proclaimed. And we now know that he'd already reached an agreement with King Abdullah of Jordan that he could occupy a part of the territory that had been allocated to the Palestinians. Uh, where Israel, you could argue, has proceeded more stealthily, you could argue this, is in the ethnic cleansing policy, which begins in 1948, not in 1947, when, the, when Israel declares itself a state and when the conflict begins. But in 1948, uh, an ethnic cleansing policy does begin, but it begins at that point under the pressure of the war of independence and the invasion of surrounding Arab states. But it continued after 1967 as a natural companion of the colonization of East Jerusalem and the West Bank. It's not mass expulsion like uh, the Serbian government in Kosovo, but there has been a slow but progressive squeezing, which has recently accelerated. Uh, to this point, I think one could say that the greater part of cleansing or expulsion has been <coughs> internal squeezing, squeezing Arabs out of East Jerusalem into the West Bank and herding rural Palestinian farmers and, and, sh and uh, sheep herders into the cities. I don't know if anyone saw the Economist article recently. That's the only place I get my news other than Stephen Colbert. <laughs> uh, I'll just, just read a very brief, a very brief excerpt from what is a brief article. Uh, armed with a list of military orders, Israeli soldiers are herding the West Bank's Palestinians out of the rural 60% of the territory, officially known as Area C, where Israel has full military and civilian control, and into cities. On some days, the Israeli army declares a patch of land to be a live fire military zone. On other days, they say the Palestinians must move because of an impending archaeological dig. The erection of hilltop stations to provide antennae for Israeli mobile phones, but not for Palestinian ones, is another off-sighted reason for pushing Palestinians out. And then it goes on to say, a senior Israeli officer recently testified in court that in the past 45 years of Israeli occupation, the army has redistributed around 70% of the West Bank land designated as state-owned, either to Jewish settlers or to the World Zionist Organization, whereas less than 1% of supposedly state-owned land was granted to Palestinians. While Israel's government expands Jewish settlements and ties them to Israel proper with a network of roads, it bars and sometimes reverses Palestinian development. It habitually denies housing permits to Palestinians, thus stunting the community's natural growth. It provides uninterrupted water to Jewish settlements. Water for the Palestinians generally comes once a week by lorry. Israeli soldiers have destroyed scores of small EU-funded projects ranging from wells to solar paneling and threatened to demolish scores more. So I would, I would argue that Israeli policy or Zionist policy, which then became Israeli policy, has been consistent since the founding of the, of the, of the movement. Uh, and that we may want to, we want to debate. So I do take a, a somewhat more, uh, we call it deterministic policy, a view of it than, than Michelin does. As for the United States, 
As both of you pointed out, no one takes very seriously its claim to be a fair-minded broker of <laughs> peace negotiations. What would be an honest statement of the U.S. <laughs> position by the U.S. if it wanted to make an honest statement of its position? It would say something like this. To have a sustainable settlement of any disagreement between two parties, if the two parties are basically symmetrical in power, well, I'll take a step back. To be sustainable, it has to be perceived as just. And I think that was a point that you made. But how does an agreement get to be perceived as just? Um, if the two parties are roughly symmetrical in power, then whatever they agree to is likely to be just because neither has the power to co coerce the other into accepting the agreement. And who are the best parties to judge what is a fair agreement? The two parties, assuming they are more or less equivalent in power. But where they are grossly asymmetrical in power, which is the actual situation, you have a, a very well-organized, high-tech, uh, powerfully militarized state, Israel on the one hand, and you have the, the Palestinians who have no effective control over any territory, no effective armed forces, fragmented leadership, all the weaknesses that we know about. So you have tremendous asymmetry between the, between the two parties. Now, when you have that tremendous asymmetry, how can you produce a, an agreement which will be perceived as just? And I think there are only two possibilities. Logically, there are only two possibilities. One is turning to international law, because international law provides some criteria, which if impartially applied, could be thought of as producing a just settlement. But it's been a consistent position of the United States that international law should not be applied to the negotiation of the conflict. That is, the conflict should be settled by political negotiation, but it's political negotiation between the asymmetrical forces. So that's the, that's the real dis, dishonesty. Now, the other way is to, where you have this asymmetry of power, is to have a third party put its finger on the scales to even out the asymmetry. But what the US has done, of course, is to put its finger on the scale of the party that is much more powerful to begin with. So it has increased the asymmetry. So how can you politically negotiate an agreement which will not appear coercive, strong power coercing the weak power, and hence will probably not be sustainable, assuming any agreement were to emerge? So if there is hypocrisy or deceit, it seems to me it's on, it's on that, there, that very point. Well, let me conclude by saying that where, where I perhaps differ with Rashid, I wish I didn't, uh, is where is all this leading? You, you seem to say, I think you do say, that the status quo is not sustainable. And perhaps you had South Africa in mind in the years preceding the collapse of apartheid. But on this issue, that analogy, I think, doesn't work. Because the, Af the Africana leadership looked around. They looked at the fact that there were 35 million blacks and about 4.5 million whites. And the disparity was growing. So that the ability, on that ground alone, the ability of the Africana regime to control the territory was declining progressively. Uh, the Africana regime had failed to neutralize the bordering states. So that was a failure, and, and there, that was a weakness of their, of their strategic position. The Africana regime needed black labor, another weakness in their, in their position. So they couldn't control the borders, and they had extensive borders. So in all sorts of ways, the Africana leadership was wise, strategically intelligent, and they made the right move. But those factors don't apply to 
the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So the closer analogy, it seems to me, is the ethnic cleansing of the American Indian population in the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, and the concentration of that population in reserves. To me, that is the model that Israel is following, grosso modo. Perhaps along with the expectation that by extinguishing hope for a decent life, the ablest and most talented and best educated Palestinians will follow Mitt Romney's advice to Hispanic immigrants to self-deport. <laughs> so it's not an expectation of you know, total disappearance of the Palestinian population. It will be small enough to manage indefinitely. And let me leave just a query, which I'd like to give to you, Rashid. Let's assume that at five critical periods, the Palestinians had a leader like Nelson Mandela, tall, rather handsome, benign looking, politically shrewd, and you were his advisor in 1947, 1967, Oslo, Camp David II, and today. How would you advise him? Thank you. How many hours do I have? How many hours do I have to answer that one? Thank you, both of you. Uh, I just said to Tom, how many hours do I have to answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, well, since I'm not tall myself, and since you know we don't have such a leader and haven't, so I, 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 that's a that's a really long question. I, I I might have time to answer, but let me let me speak to all the other important things that. Speaking of not being tall. Yeah, so. well, it's too far away. It's not just too high. Um, uh, there's so many interesting points that were raised by both of them. I'll try and speak to as many of them as I can in what ten minutes or so. Whatever. Um, <laughs> I, I, unless you stop me, I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to go from the end to the beginning. So I'm going to take Tom's points, uh, with fewer of which I have something to say, about fewer of which I have something to say, and then I'll continue with Micheline's points. Um, when I argued that the status quo is not sustainable, I did not have the South African analogy in mind. I don't think the analogy is very good. Uh, I think there are many reasons, some of which you adduced. The, the best reason that there's no parallel between Israel and South Africa is, I don't know if any of you were around in this period, but you may have noticed that South Africa did not have a Boer lobby on Capitol Hill. I mean, there is not a large body of Americans for whom the welfare of Israel is a primary concern and they will vote on this issue. And where what an Israeli leader like Netanyahu says will get uh, 500, 435 uh, uh, members of Congress and 100 senators on their feet. I mean, can you imagine a, a South African leader coming to Capitol Hill? It's a different, it's a, it's a completely different in any number of ways. So I really don't, I had, did not have that in mind. It's not sustainable because you can't hold people down forever. You can co-opt them, you can divide them, you can put them in cantons, but you can't hold them down forever. Secondly, you cannot argue that you are a Jewish democratic state when two thirds of the existence of the Israeli state, it's held these people down. You cannot argue that. Sooner or later, that reality is going to become. Israel is a military occupier which has held on to these territories for two thirds of its existence. Israel is the occupation. The occupation is Israel. The 19 idyllic years between 1948 and 1967 are history. They're a minor flicker in the longer 65 year history of Israel's existence. And this occupation is going to go on and on and on. It's not slated to end, it's meant to be permanent. Um, the other reason. I think, uh, is that you have to look at the two legal systems. Uh, the, uh, I, I strongly recommend to you that you see a movie called The Law in These Parts, which talks about the Israeli system of military justice and the occupied territories by Israeli filmmaker, uh, I think his name is Gilad Atzmon. It's a brilliant, brilliant piece of cinema, but it's a wonderful documentary on what the legal system, the completely separate legal system that Palestinians live under looks like. Uh, it's interviews with the people who've administered this system since 1967, including an Israeli Supreme Court justice who served first in the occupied territories and then uh, became a Supreme Court justice, Meir Shamgar. Uh, it's an absolutely brilliant film and it shows you another reason why this is not sustainable. Israel is running a system of military injustice for Arabs 
in the occupied territories, and an Israeli system that is, you know, one of the more interesting legal experiments in modern history for Israeli Jews or Israeli Arabs inside Israel. Um, so I think these are examples of why, over time, uh, this is not sustainable. Uh, very quickly, I agree with what you said about East, uh, uh, asymmetry and, and what an American, honest American statement would be. But my book wasn't about uh, Jabotinsky or Israel. My book was about the United States. The, the deceitful, the broker of deceit is the United States. I think Jabotinsky and every, every politician out of the revisionist school was absolutely honest. Begin was honest. Shamir was honest. Netanyahu was honest. I would not say that for labor Zionism. Labor Zionism is, is, has been as deceitful as it comes uh, on these issues, hiding its true intentions, sometimes uh, uh, from only the British, sometimes from the Arabs, mainly from the Arabs. Um, and that, that was true back in the 20s and the 30s when Weizmann and Ben-Gurion would say to the British, you know we mean a Jewish state. We're not going to say that. We mean a state where we're a majority, and we're going to get that majority, and we're going to dominate that state. That was never said until the Biltmore program. That was deceitful. But that's not what I'm talking about in this book. The book's not about Israel or Zionism. The book is about American policy. Um, last thing in relation to what Tom said um, about expulsions and ethnic cleansing. I think it's worth looking carefully at not just the writings of, of Benny Morris uh, on this subject, which I think are very good in spite of his very right-wing hawkish views, um, but also this recent piece by Ari Shavit, in the New Yorker. Now, Ari is as right wing as they come. He's a, you know, a right labor centrist. In, the United, in American terms, it'd be you know, very right of center. But in Israeli terms, he's sort of center left. Uh, and it's interesting, this article uh, about the expulsion of the entire population of the city of, of Lid, Lidda, uh, Lud, uh, today, where the airport is, where Ben Gurion Airport is today. Um, <clears throat> it's very interesting, because this was a mass expulsion, one of many. Um, the areas that became Israel inside the 1949 armistice lines, had a Jewish population of a little over 600,000 at that time. People were still coming, always coming in, so it was up to 700,000 maybe by 1949. The Arab population in that territory would have been 900,000. 150,000 of them remained as citizens of the state of Israel. 750,000 of them were made refugees. So by a proportion of five to one, the Palestinians were expelled. Five-sixths of the Arab population of the area that became the state of Israel in 1949 within the armistice lines, the green line, so-called. You couldn't have had a Jewish state there. In fact, the 1947 armistice lines, uh, sorry, the 1947 partition lines would have created a state with an Arab minority of in the high 40% range. And the partition plan talked about a Jewish state which would have had a huge Arab minority. And that minority was entitled, according to that partition plan, to various legal protections. So. Mass expulsion is in the DNA of Zionism. And only the, only, only the revisionists were honest about that. Uh, people like Ben-Gurion would do things like, he would be asked by a military man, what do I do with these people? He went like that. He wouldn't give a written order. Of course he wouldn't give a written order. He understood. This was in the wake of World War II. He understood what written orders were. He said, he, he was pointing towards Jordan, kick them out. Do what you have to do, that kind of thing. So uh, it was, it was uh, a mass expulsion. But I don't think this is going to lead to a Native American situation. Yes, that is sort of the logic of it. But go to Galilee and look at what has happened 65 years after. Most of the land, most of the people were expelled. Uh, five, six of Palestinians who live in what became Israel in 1949 were expelled uh, within the armistice lines. Look at Galilee. Look at Nazareth. Nazareth had all its land taken away. Uh, Nazareth elite. Upper Nazareth was established to limit the growth of Nazareth, put a Jewish town uh, right next to it, prevent it from expanding. People in, in Nazareth are piled on top of one another. Uh, and look at Upper Nazareth today. It has a 25% Arab population. Look at some of the settlements around Jerusalem. Look at French Hill. Look at uh, Pisgat Zev. Uh, there, there's an there's a, there's a, there's a infiltration into them of people from 1948, Palestinian Israelis, and people from Jerusalem who have Jerusalem IDs uh, into these areas, such that this putting them on the reservation is, is actually not working within, uh, within Israel and the occupied territory. So that is the intention, I agree. I just don't think you can do it without the kind of mass extermination that some colonial projects, the American and the Australian, actually were able successfully to carry out. You can put a remnant onto a population, but when the Arab population between the river and the sea is larger than the Jewish population. It's not larger by North and South African proportions, but it is at least 
about the same and growing larger. I just don't think you can do that. So those are reasons why I argue for the non-sustainability of it. Let me talk about some of Micheline's points. Um, I grant you, there is a little bit of a determinism in this book. You're right. I, I argue a little bit about inevitability. And the reason I do this is because some of the documents I saw that relate to the 70s and the 80s really shocked me in that they are the DNA of the present. In other words, something happened such that what the lines that Begin laid down became the determinants of the outcomes. And I'm trying to explain that in this book. I'm not explaining it in terms of Israeli policy because we know that Begin was the patriarch. I mean, Jabotinsky was the patriarch. Begin was the real founder of the modern political existence of this strand of thinking. He became the first Likud prime minister. And we understand that, what, you know, if, if Netanyahu is the son of, of Ben Zion Netanyahu, he's the spiritual son of Jabotinsky and the political heir of Begin. So we can see why, from an Israeli point of view, that would be the case. But why didn't the United States do something about it? And I actually do argue that there were things that could have been done. I don't argue that it was inevitable. President Carter saw this, which is why he pushed for an American-Soviet joint communique, which is why he pushed for a Geneva conference, which is why he pushed at Camp David for a more expansive definition of autonomy. And in none of these cases did he succeed. That's why President Reagan and his Secretary of State, Schultz, pushed very, very hard for an entirely different interpretation of autonomy than what Begin uh, uh, was interested in. And I, I argue this more briefly than I should, I agree, for five of the six American presidents from Carter to the present one. I think all five of them, with the exception of George W. Bush, understood perfectly well that there was something fundamentally wrong with this, or at least had an inkling that there was something wrong with it. This whole approach, uh, keeping the Palestinians away from the table, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about why and how in a minute. Um, <coughs> allowing the Israelis to dictate the terms and so on and so forth. Um, but I, I, if, I, if my, the reasons I adduce why that happened aren't satisfactory, somebody else can give the reasons. But the outcomes are not in doubt. Those are the outcomes. American presidents said they wanted to do something. They ended up not doing something. Reagan put out a plan. Where's the Reagan plan? Disappeared without a trace. Uh, where is what President Carter tried to do at Camp David? Disappeared without a trace. Where are Clinton's efforts? Disappeared without a trace. George W. Bush. I mean, I met with Baker. I remember the things that Baker said. I was there when he was talking in some of these meetings. I know what he intended to do. What was the outcome? Disappeared without a trace. President Obama's first term, there should be the 1949 armistice lines should be the basis of a settlement. What happened to that position? Disappeared without a trace. I could go on and on. So you can quibble with me about me being a little too de deterministic. I, I agree with you. And you can even quibble with me. I don't think it's a quibble. I think it's a legitimate argument that I haven't necessarily analyzed why that happened. But that is what happened. You cannot argue with that. And I, I don't know if the reasons are that I, I, I give are right. Now, as for the PLO and its approach to the table, I, I'm not sure what the peer, when the interview you ran 1993. from. 83. 93. 93. 93. Well, the, the one on the really? magazine. Yeah, the one that you just, yes. you just quoted from. Um, but. Uh, with all due respect to Edward, whom I, I, I revere as an as a, as a intellectual and as a, as a, a, a heroic figure in the Palestinian uh, struggle, um, I think I was closer to events in Beirut than he was in New York. And from 1974 onwards, with zigs and zags, the PLO was not very intelligently moving away from armed struggle and moving towards getting involved in negotiations. But to its enormous credit, it understood that coming to the Camp David autonomy table was a disaster. That's why it insisted on a approach based on international law, on UN resolutions, in which there would be some balance to the structure. That's why they wanted Geneva. Not because they loved the Soviet Union, but because they understood that unless you had somebody to balance the Americans, you were not going to have a proper approach. I would reproach the PLO, as Edward himself did in devastating critique, critique that he wrote in 93, uh, I would uh, fault Arafat for in 93, and even before 93, abandoning that correct approach and saying, we have no alternative but to go with the Americans. We have no alternative but to accept Begin's scheme. That was a mistake. The PLO was dying to negotiate from sometime in the 1980s. They were desperate to negotiate, but they were not desperate to negotiate on any terms and under any circumstances. They would not go 
to a negotiation which said you can have no more than Begin's ceiling of autonomy. And that was agreed upon by Sadat, by Carter, and by Begin in an international treaty which the United States, Israel, and Egypt were bound to. You were not going to go to that table and change those terms. So those were the wrong terms to go to the table under, in my view. And when they, in effect, accepted those terms at, uh, at Oslo, Edward Said was correct. This was the Palestinian Versailles. It was a catastrophic surrender. He used the word ter- the words Versailles, and he used the word surrender. So you, you're right. The Palestinian movement was completely incoherent in continuing to advocate violence when they really wanted negotiations. You're absolutely right in saying uh, that they were, at, on the one hand, they wanted the United States, but they were afraid of the United States. But the thing that I would add is that they understood correctly that the terms that were offered them were pretty identical to what the British were offering. You know, the British said throughout the mandate, we will talk to you, representatives of the overwhelming majority in this country, on one condition, that you accept the terms of the mandate for Palestine. What were the terms of the mandate for Palestine? Great Britain was enjoined to establish a Jewish national home in Palestine. And there's not a word about the Palestinians or the Arabs or their national or their political rights. The Palestinians, in order to be allowed to come to the table, by the British were required to deny their own national existence and their own national aspirations. If you accept the terms of the mandate, you accept that there is one people with national rights in Palestine, the Jewish people. That's what the mandate says. And uh, in my book, The Iron Cage, I quote, I forget which British uh, 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 colonial secretary telling, I don't remember which Palestinian delegation, You have to accept the terms of the mandate if you want us to talk to you. This is an informal meeting. I don't accept to meet with you formally. You represent nobody. They were the representatives, elected representatives, the overwhelming majority of the population. The same colonial secretary would sit down with Weizmann as if he were a head of state and had to, by the terms of the mandate, the the Jewish agency was given a a, a position in international law as 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 in effect uh, 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 something like the state of Palestine as it's been accepted by the General Assembly. This is back in the 20s, whereas the representatives of the overwhelming majority of the population, the 85% at that time, or 84% of the population, he wouldn't even talk to unless they accept as a premise for talking that you don't exist as a people, there is one people, and it's not you. And our job is to do this, 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 and this for that people. Read the articles of the mandate. Uh, It's a very interesting reading. The word Arab and Palestinian doesn't exist, and they're entitled to rights, civil and religious rights. Those are the rights that the non-Jewish population, the overwhelming majority, is not described as you are you. No, you are not them. And those of you who are not them can have civil and religious rights. Well, they wouldn't, couldn't, didn't go to the table. If I were an advisor in 1936 or 39 or 28, I actually say what I would have done. I would have accepted the white paper in a hot second. I would have accepted other initiatives. But you, you had to get out of what I call an iron cage, which is what the British had established for them. And they could have done it at various points. And it was the inflexibility, the lack of imagination, being cut off from their own people that led that leadership to fail. And and I would argue you could say the same thing about the PLO leadership. Again and again and again, they failed. Again, I've written about this elsewhere. I don't want to go into it now. Let me say a couple other things uh, in response to your very, very good points. I agree with you. Um, uh, Micheline, Madrid, Washington was not as important as I make it in the book. Um, but it produced what I think was really the important moment, which is the Oslo Accords. I think the Oslo Accords really are the game changer. By 2000, I'll talk about why I don't think Camp David in 2000 was a game changer. Uh, 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 By 2000, things had changed a lot. I'll talk about that in a minute. But what we did in Washington, the failure that we had in Washington, the failure of our negotiations alongside successful Jordanian negotiations and very close to successful Syrian negotiations with the Israelis, separate negotiations, our failure nevertheless made it clear that the Palestinians not only could not get sovereignty, could not even get jurisdiction or control of the occupied territories under any deal that would be accepted, not just by the Shamir government, but by the by the Rabin government. And that was the deal that finally they accepted, in my, in my view, mistakenly, in Oslo. And that has, that has determined outcomes since then. Now, could that have been changed at Camp David? In principle, yes, it could have been. But I, I, I suggest you look at Camp David as it was then 
and not as it has been rewritten by so many of the participants. Who went to Camp David? Were these leaders at the height of their powers? Who was Ehud Barak and where was he? He was a man who had lost his majority in the Knesset. He was a lame duck. He was uh, uh, cruising for a bruising. He was ready to fall. He was a ripe apple. You can, you, I can give you any metaphor you want. This was a leader who banked on failure and failed. He went there, he said it himself, to prove that the Palestinians weren't ready to agree. Why were you going if that's what you were out to prove? Moreover, who thinks that a Barak is going to save himself by a deal that he himself does not have confidence in? That's the first leader. Who's the second leader? Second leader is Yasser Arafat. Where is Yasser Arafat in 2000? He's come back to a hero's welcome in the mid-90s. By 2000, the Palestinians are ready to explode. Any moron who went to Gaza could see that if there was not an uprising against the Israelis, there would be an uprising against the Palestinian Authority. I was there in the spring, and I was shocked by the hatred for the PA, for the agreement, and even less, I would argue, for Israel. The same was true to a lesser extent in the West Bank. This was a leader who was losing his credibility rapidly because the deal he had signed was perceived by an overwhelming majority of Palestinians to have been a catastrophe for the Palestinians. He had very little margin for maneuver. He was a lame duck in 2000. And then finally, I mean, most of you are Americans and have lived in this country for a bit. What is the power of an American president in the last five months of his presidency? May I know? of his second term. He was not a lame duck, he was a dead duck. <laughs> President Clinton, when he went to Camp David. What kind of deal could have been uh, negotiated by these people? You want, a, you want a time when I think a deal could have been struck. It was 92, 93, in the early period, right after the Intifada, when the Labor Party understood it could not continue with the means of the past, you could have driven a Mack truck through Begin's conditions. That's where the PLO failed. That's where Baker and his team failed. And that's why Rabin failed. Um, uh, I talked to people in, in Rabin's. I mean, I interviewed them for the book. I have, their, I have the, the minutes of meetings with people like Yossi Balin. We talked to them. They are, some of them understood this stuff. But around Rabin were a group of military men. His old, you know, this is a, he's a general. You know, he was not terribly comfortable with civilians. You know, basically, you had to be a brigadier general, a colonel, or a major general for Rabin to have any confidence in you. So he had confidence in, in Itamar Rabinovich and made him the head of the delegation negotiating with the Syrians, not because he was Israel's top expert on Syria. That was icing on the cake. It was because he was a colonel in the reserves. He was in military intelligence. He was a man that Rabin could talk to because he was like him. He was an officer. He had confidence in Shlomo Gazit, who was the man who negotiated the security arrangements that preceded Oslo because he was a major general. He had he'd been the coordinator of affairs in the occupied territories. He'd been the director of military intelligence. He had been Rabin's subordinate again and again and again in the army. He knew him. He trusted him. And what did Gazit tell him? Gazit told him, we cannot control these territories ourselves. We need somebody else to do it for, him, for us. And that's what Rabin saw Arafat as doing. Rabin would be Israel's auxiliary. And Gazit actually said it in my presence. I quote it in the book. He said it at a, at a, at a conference at uh, Amherst College where somebody asked him a question that really irritated him. You know, Israeli major generals are not used to questions that are annoying. You know, you ask me an annoying question, it's my job to sort of smile and give it back to you. And, you know, that's not what they do when they're generals. I don't think our generals are much better than that, actually. In fact, I don't know any major general who likes hostile questions. So somebody asked him a question, some uppity kid, 17-year-old at Amherst, asked him a question about Arafat, which offended him. And he said, I can't, my son is an actor and he can do the very good Israeli general accent. I can't do it. He does, he, he can that growl that they have. He said, Arafat has a choice. Arafat can be a lahad or he can be a super lahad. Who is lahad? Lahad was General Antoine Lahad, the commander of the South Lebanese army. Israel's native auxiliaries in their occupation of South Lebanon. That is how not just Shlomo Gazit, saw Arafat and the PLO, that is how they saw, that's how I would argue, that's the failure of Rabin. To say we, we can't control these territories, right. We have to recognize the PLO, right. But we have to treat them not as our auxiliaries, our natives, our harkis, as the French would put it in Algeria, native soldiers fighting for the colonial power. We have to treat them. He didn't have that imagination. Uh, he was close to it. I mean, at the time of the uh, at the time of the Hebron massacre in '94, 
he was almost swayed to shut down Kiryat Arba and pull the settlers out of Hebron. That was a turning point. That could have been. Any time until his assassination, I think he could have been swayed. But uh, there are many reasons why they were a failure. The major reason I would put on the Palestinians myself, if they'd had the imagination and had had mass support and had pushed at the right moments in the right ways, they might have been able to persuade either the Bush administration uh, or the Clinton administration. Though I had, uh, I have reasons why the Clinton administration might have been very difficult in its early years. It was very incoherent when they first came into office in 93. Um, so yes, there were missed opportunities. I, I agree, and I should have maybe put them in the book. Um, one last thing, I, 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 I should talk about what's next, um, but one last thing. No, let me skip that. Let me just talk about what's next. Yeah, well, okay, the first time farce, the second time tragedy, what's the third time? Um, I, I didn't do this last night, so let me do it now. And I, I thank you for the opportunity to, to, to do this. Um, I, I don't think the conclusion of this book is bleak, but let me outline for you a rosy scenario. Okay? I don't just think this situation is unsustainable. Now, us, unsustainable can continue forever. You know, it can be unsustainable in the long run, and in the long run, as we were told by Lord Keynes, we're all dead. So that's no good. <laughs> what we want is something that's unsustainable in the short run, so people have an incentive to change. And I think those incentives are coming. I actually think the absolute discomfort of some of the contradictions between Jewish and Democratic between a rule of law in Israel and a rule of injustice in the occupied territories, between selling a project that's based on an idea of eternal existential to the Jewish, danger to the Jewish people, which is a false project, and a project based on some kind of hope for Israel. Those contradictions are actually quite acute, and they're more acute here maybe than they are in Israel. I think that you're going to have serious problems with selling the idea that Israel is in eternal danger, and that justifies everything. The chapter on Obama is an attempt to analyze American political discourse as the president articulates it, and it's a fundamentally false discourse. Israel does have fears, profound fears, especially the older generations. They have been taught that the Jewish people is always in danger, and every generation they'll come after us, there is always a fill in the blank, a golem who's going to come out. And Ben-Gurion, uh, ben sorry, Netanyahu deeply believes that. His father taught him, and he believes it. But that is not the truth. Moreover, over time, as you, you've suggested, the, Arab, the changes in the Arab world have shown Israel that, in fact, there's no particular danger in the immediate, immediate environment. They're going to come to terms with the fact that we have been lured into ignoring the dangers closest to home in what we are doing in the occupied territories, in the demographic transformation of the whole land of Israel slash Palestine, by this fear here and fear there and fear there. Now, that may take longer or shorter time. I see it happening among younger generations of Americans uh, more than I see it happening among large groups of Israelis. There are some Israelis who see this, many more than before, but not very many. In this country, though, I, I, I would argue with Peter Beinert and with many people who are analyzing how the American Jewish community is evolving that uh, I would really not like to be on the side of the 65-year-olds who control the major institutions of the American Jewish community and 75-year-olds. I'd much rather be on the side of the 25 and 18 and 30-year-olds uh, who are the larger part and the smarter part and the more educated and more open-minded part of the American Jewish community. Those people see this thing fundamentally different. And that is not a good thing for the liquid view of the world. It's not a good thing for the maintenance of settlements and occupation, which is what Israel is basically trying to sell. It's unsellable in the United States. You can sell it in Israel, maybe, for a while. I think in Israel it's going to be difficult over time. Uh, so that is, to my way of thinking, a, a, a sign of hope. The second sign of hope, leaving aside Israel and the United States, is that in Palestine you have a completely bankrupt generation of leadership. The best people of the generation that dominates Palestinian politics, the Abu Mazen genera generation, are six feet under. Most of them assassinated in the 70s and the 80s. They're all dead, the good ones. And what was the people who were left were between us, not worth a bullet. Okay? They were left there because they did more harm than good. And they have succeeded in doing more harm than good. But these people are at the end of their tether, just actuarially. And I don't know where the next generation of leadership is going to come from. Is it going to come from the prisons? 
Maybe. That's where Mandela and much of the ANC leadership matured and developed. Uh, that's where some of the best, most knowledgeable Palestinians with the clearest understanding of Israel uh, come from. That's where attempts to reconcile the imbecilic uh, and the imbecilic split between Fatah and Hamas came from, from the prisons. They saw that this split was, and they were members of Hamas and Fatah, and they put together the prisoner's document, which is the basis for whenever it happens, a Palestinian-Palestinian reconciliation. The Palestinians cannot change the situation until they put their house in order, and that will happen sooner or later. And when it happens, good things can happen. Until it happens, good things can't happen. You can't blame the Americans and you can't blame the Israelis, though the United States exacerbated inter-Palestinian divisions. The United States was not an innocent parent watching brats squabble. The United States was a evil parent giving one brat support, weapons, CIA training so that it could take over from another parent in Gaza. Uh, and that's what provoked Hamas's coup against uh, Dahlan and his thugs uh, uh, back in uh, 2007. Six? Six. Um, so, there are signs. Uh, they're, not terribly in, they're not terribly encouraging in many ways. I think what's happening in terms of BDS, I think what's happening in terms of resistance to the extension of the wall, I think what's happening in terms of Palestinian and Israelis getting together and fighting in various ways with, uh, over the law is important. And I think the way Palestinian Israelis, the most evolved segment of the Palestinian population who are citizens of Israel, are understanding that they are sort of the vanguard of Palestinians. They were the ones who were first subjected to the same treatment that the Palestinians of 67 have been subjected to for the past 46 years. That knowledge spreading across the Green Line and helping in the maturation of Palestinians in, six, in the 67 areas, that's going to be very important for the Palestinian national movement uh, 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 in the future. So I, I think there are things that are not easy to see, but which actually are signs, positive signs uh, for the future. Thanks. Thank you, Rashid, for reminding us why we invited you to Denver. It's too long. Um, it is now 1.35. I want to move to Q&A. And if Micheline and Tom have things that they'd like to say in response to Rashid, um, I would like them to uh, do so in this Q&A period. I'm sorry, what, Andrea? I'm going to just forego pizza at this point. Um, I let think them this go is, get pizza while they're They're welcome to, but yeah, I'm not going to stop the program. Um, I authorize you to have pizza. I'm no, overruled. Look at Very it. good. Look. No, no, no. Absolutely. And I, by the These way, I should apologize. Well, I apologize for the pizza fiasco. Um, but I, we do, we do need to move on. Okay. Question number one. Question number two. Please, Heather. Rashid, and I have a feeling Tom might have some thoughts on that as a leading scholar of international human rights, as well as Micheline. Should we answer from here? Why don't you, yes, why don't you go first, Rashid? Uh, I, is, this, is this working? Um, do you want to briefly restate the question, Yeah, the Rashid? question had to do with um, what I said about um, the use of international law as a basis for a resolution. And uh, I don't know your name. Heather, Heather Yeah, uh, uh, Heather pointed out that there are various problems with using human rights law. One of them is that the PLO is not a state. 
And the other is that if individuals go before the International Criminal Court, there are various ways in which that causes complications. I'm going to duck on part of this question, because I, uh, to my right and to my left are people who have actually written books on international law. One of them is a JD, so I'm not going to mess with law. <laughs> she has five, four books on the subject. <laughs> He's a lawyer. So I, I would suggest you direct some aspects of those questions to them. I will say, however, that as, as Micheline properly said, and as my good friend Rajesh Hadi, who is a lawyer and was one of the legal advisors, uh, to the Palestinian delegation in the negotiations in Madrid and Washington said, the, the Palestinians have to use more effectively uh, the, 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 the Geneva Conventions and this issue of occupation. Uh, again, go see this movie, uh, The Law in These Parts, and see how Israeli military lawyers understood the danger to Israel's position of an acceptance of the fact that Israel was an occupier and what that made incumbent on them. If they see how much of a problem this is for them, then the Palestinians are... Uh, irresponsible in not using that more effectively. So I agree completely with you. I didn't say that in my comments. I agree completely with you on that. But let me leave human rights to you two, okay? Let me just say that my view, a expansive and an intelligent and an inventive Palestinian use of international law should be broad and should talk about international legality, not just specific aspects of human rights law. Uh, there are things on the books there are, there are UN resolutions on the books, which I, I don't think can necessarily be implemented in every detail, but the principles of which I think have to be argued for by the Palestinians. I think allowing yourself to be put in a box where international law is thrown away and American diplomats tell you, this is what can be done, this has to be the basis, is a recipe for a, a bad outcome. I think you have to argue, we insist that the basis for this be X, Y, and Z, or at least the principles derived from X, Y, and Z. For example, the, the partition resolution, 181, has a lot of important principles. Among them, what a Jewish state is. Among them, the fact that a Palestinian Arab state is legitimate. This should not be something you have to beg the Israelis for. The UN already gave it to you, not in 2012, in 1947. It is an absolute inalienable right. Now, Israel, Israel argues that its birth certificate is the actions of its founders, not 181. Well, they can say whatever they want. 181 is Israel's birth certificate. It is its, its, its ticket to international legitimacy. And the Palestinians are foolish for not just not stressing that, but for not stressing the other side of it, which is that that same ticket to Israel's legitimacy is also a ticket to the pre-existence of a Palestinian state. And to his Edward's credit, and, and Ibrahim Abu Lughid's, the late Ibrahim Abu Lughid, the late Mahmoud Darwish, the late Edward Said's credit, they were the ones who put this in the Palestinian Declaration of Independence in 1988, this same insistence. Well, we've gone too far away from uh, understanding of how these and other principles should be the basis uh, for any uh, approach to a settlement. It's not just international law in terms of the Geneva Conventions, though I certainly think that is the case, and many other things. It's, it's, it's a broader understanding of what international legality is. You want to say something? I refer to you. Um. Well, thank you for the question, because it, it allows me to push a little bit one of the points I wanted to make at the end of, of my comments. So you were right yesterday when you just took ask about the Geneva Conventions. Israel has commitment as occupier in the West Bank, and it's not meeting even uh, its, its role and its duty as an occupier. So s several cases are brought to the Supreme Court. Sometimes they are met and heard, and sometimes there are, there are concessions made with those cases, and sometimes they're just pushed aside for military and security reasons. So I think that that has to be pushed. Second issue is the following. At this point in time, we have a de facto annexation of the state of Israel in the West Bank. And so, and my colleagues and, and co-writers of an article, uh, uh, David Kretzmer, uh, indicated something in Aharetz, which was very interesting. He said, if we are going to continue to have a de facto annexation of the West Bank, then by definition, Palestinians can make the claim that they have, they want to have the individual right expand just the way, same way as Israeli had. If that, this is not going to gain currency, by the way, as you know, among Israeli or Palestinians who want actually to have some form of two-state and solutions and separations. But nonetheless, strategically and with respect to discourse, this is certainly something Very that I, I would have Very loved important. to see and hear more from the Palestinian side, because the framework of negotiation has always been about territorial control. 
but rarely we have heard as a framework of negotiations that we want to have our individual and collective rights to frame those, the process of negotiations. That's beginning, by the way, among Palestinians. That debate is just beginning. And that will be so much more welcoming, because at least we will know, because we know that a state, i.e. qua state, not even a state in Gaza with Hamas, would not be the type of state that will meet the preconditions of human rights and universal rights that we would like to see, you would like to see. Uh, occurring. So, of course, those are the parameters, so much more para important parameters than sort of instituting and just trying to figure out which lands can be retained from this yeah. impossible situation that has occurred in uh, the post-1967 borders. If we can move the mic over to Tom. Oh, well, Thank you, Rashid. No well, international, international law is, is a discourse. It's not simply like domestic law, something you can take to court through compulsory jurisdiction and have them resolved. You could go after, not you, uh, individual Israelis, if, if Sharon were not a vegetable at the present time, certainly if he could, he could be prosecuted for his collusion in the massacre in the Palestinian refugee camps in 1982. That's the clearest case of a violation of the laws that the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over. Um, but the, and the Lebanese government could say that the, if you had a well-established Lebanese government at the moment, if you had one, they could say the crime occurred on Lebanese soil um, perhaps it would be a possibility, but I don't really see the uses of the law in the same sense that we'd use it domestically, but I see it as, as an important discourse. And the United States, and this is a, one of the most important points that Rashid, Rashid has made, the United States has con consistently repudiated the use of international law as a framework for thinking about the conflict. Uh, personally, it, the two-state solution seems to me no longer plausible because of the extent of the settlements. And therefore, the emphasis should be on individual rights. There is de facto annexation, as Micheline has, has pointed out. They don't want to annex the entire territory because if the entire territory were formally annexed, it's much harder to continue to deny the individual human rights of the individuals in the territory, the right to vote, the right to be subject to Israeli due process law it would be the end. You, you may have noticed that whenever there is a prisoner exchange, people, people say, one Israeli prisoner, and the Israelis truly love their people because they will exchange hundreds of Palestinians for one Israeli Israeli soldier, let's say, who's been kidnapped. Very few people ask, but, but wait, why are there all these hundreds of Palestinian <laughs> prisoners there? But many of them have never been tried. If they have been tried, they've been tried by these military tribunals with a very dubious due process, introduction of, of evidence obtained through coerce, highly coercive means, sometimes torture, and so on. So that's, that seems to me the future, but the problem is, one of the problems is that the potential possession, like that is the capital of Palestinians, has been stripped away. That's, now, much of the territory that would have belonged to Palestinian families over time was classified as public land, was held in effect, in trust for future generations, held by the Jordanians at one point. And that land has, has been, in effect, expropriated and given to the settlers. So the, the Palestinians need compens compensation. And, that's the, and that, to me, has been the answer to the refugee problem. If every refugee family, that is the refugees outside the, outside the Palestinian the Palestinian Mandate Territory, if every refugee family were given a million dollars, which sounds like an extraordinary sum, when you think of all the costs 
that have gone into maintaining the status quo, it's not that large. And suddenly, each refugee family would be turned into a potential investor. It would be much easier for those families to find homes and to be assimilated into the countries where they find themselves in wretched circumstances. So that, if that's the approach that I think leads somewhere. I don't see any other approach leading anywhere. So I would like to see annexation. Now the Israelis say the Fourth Geneva Convention doesn't apply. They have some very clever lawyers who have made some very clever arguments. Practically all international lawyers disagree. The International Committee of the Red Cross, which is the, the formal guardian of the Geneva Conventions, disagrees. Most diplomats disagree, but this is the Israeli, the formal Israeli position that, that it doesn't apply. And that precludes, that precludes any settlement. And it precludes, of course, all the expulsions from the territory. So the Israelis will never admit that the Fourth Geneva Convention applies. But it is truly occupied territory, even though there's some imperfections between the language, the, the literal language of the Fourth Convention. It was designed for a circumstance where an army occupies a territory which it regards as filled with hostiles. And so if you look at the principle underlying the Fourth Geneva Convention, it fits here. And that's why I believe it applies. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I want to start off by saying that I really uh, appreciate your talk. Uh, being in the Middle East and here in the United States, it's not always common to see somebody uh, speak out about the conflict going on in the region. So I really do admire that. Um, there were various times when the lax and the public uh, peace strategy was mentioned. And I had a question uh, regarding this. Just for an example, there was the 2009 Gaza conflict uh, where 1,500 uh, people were killed. Rashid, you want to just briefly uh, brief. summarize we the... Don't have a lot of time, I understand. Um, well, I mean, I, I address this in the book by talking about <laughs> discourse. This is, this is a lot to do with discourse. Um, some people killing civilians is collateral damage or legitimate function of military operations. Other people killing civilians is terrorism. And in the Gaza conflict, you have over 1,400 people killed, most of them civilians. And you had about 13 or 14 Israelis killed, almost all of them military. And most, half of them killed by friendly fire, apparently, according to the Israeli army. So you have an enormous disparity. And yet, in our political discourse, if you listen to the speeches on Capitol Hill, or you read carefully, as I tried to do, the president's speeches on this issue, only one side suffers. It's the Israelis. The Palestinians have a problem. It's an issue. They have some rights. He's very generous towards the Palestinians. But uh, there, is a, there is an Israeli narrative of Israeli and Jewish victimization, which is central to the way the president addresses this issue. And I mean, all I could say to you is we have to address that and change that. You know, all it's incumbent on all of us to change that. That's not the president. The president is speaking a discourse that has become, you know, second nature to American politicians because we as voters and citizens have to get away with it. Um, are there other questions? Yes, sir. Solution, one state, no two state solution, 
by four. Their way is this time we could change the only population that we have to go to. And I know there are big differences culturally and uh, places are difficult to put together. I think the only solution I could see to all of this is one state solution, which we would like to think about. Um, Rashid? Um, I mean, this is a huge topic, as you know, obviously. Um, and in, in the book and in other things I've written, I have argued that um, the time when it would be easy to create a two-state solution is long past. Um, so that there are huge problems with the two-state solution. It's not just eating half the pizza. In fact, uh, most of the territory of the, uh, of the West Bank is reserved for Israelis right now, whether it's military zones, whether it's been given to the Karen Kayameth, whether it's been given to the World Dinosaur, whether it's reserved for settlements. Most of it is not actually occupied. So you could reverse that tomorrow by saying, you know, the settlements are exactly the area of Ariel and not one centimeter outside the wall, outside the fence. Uh, and all the land reverts. This, this incredible piece of legal ledger main of declaring land to Moeth and state land and then the state is us and you the people are not the beneficiaries. And that, that could be reversed too. State land belongs to the majority of the population. It belongs to the Palestinians. All of it should go. I mean, you could reverse this, but I still think that the two-state solution faces perhaps insuperable obstacles. But I would suggest that so does a one-state solution, which is one reason that it's not going to be that easy to get out of this box that the bulldozers and Sharon's brilliant plans have put us in. Again, see this film, uh, 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 the law in these parts. You have the actual originator of the idea of Mawat land, state, which is the basis for this seizure of most of the land of the West Bank for, the, for Israeli settlers talking about how he came up with the idea in a meeting and how Sharon came and sat down next to him and said, you come to my office at 8 o'clock. And they were in a helicopter the next day seeing land that could be declared Moet and taken over and where settlements could be put. Um, a one-state solution faces really serious obstacles. There are two big ones, and I'd love to see people address them. The first is international legality argues that there is a Jewish and an Arab state. And it's not just international legality. The entire world community premises its approach to this conflict, outdated though it may be, on a two-state solution. You don't just have to say, it's dead. You have to convince 200 states that are committed to this, going right back to 1947, that they have to completely change their approach. That's the first thing. The second is something that Nishneen talked about. Many Palestinians and many Israelis have come to the conclusion that a rights-based approach is the best. That you can only do this in terms of what you're saying. They've already taken so much of this land. Israeli law has already been extended to the occupied territories. There is de facto annexation. Take the next step, demand to vote, demand rights, and so on and so on. Two pro the second problem is that most Israelis don't want to be part of a Jewish Arab state. And the second is most Arabs don't want to be part of a Jewish Arab state. There's a strong desire on the part of Israelis to maintain some form of Israel, more or less as it is. And there's a strong desire on the part of Palestinians who have never enjoyed the right to self-determination or, sta or statehood in their entire modern history to have what everybody else has. Now, you could go around these things. You could change those views over time. But I would love to see a practical argument either for how you reverse the process of settlement and achieve a two-state solution or how you overcome these legal, these, I think, very powerful arguments of international legitimacy and the desire of both peoples to live separately. Um, so I'm not saying it's hopeless. I'm simply saying it's not as easy as it sounds to say, well, we go for one state. Do you want to add anything? Or I, yeah. I, I think that you summarized very well as what I perceived also to be a, the difficulty of one state and a two-state solution. Um, there is no constituency that will support that in this current uh, political context. So I think that what Rashid Khalidi said is correct. So the question is, as we are trying to develop you know, milestones for confidence, what do Palestinians, how can they actually advance their rights, which has been uh, sidelined for too long? And sort of, it, it's to think of, in the terms of the discourses that we were just talking about, in terms of human rights principles, in terms of voting rights, the discourse could go the following way. This is. Palestinians could say, okay, you want to have annexed our land, it has to be Israeli. Fine, you have two solutions. Um, just give us more voting rights. We want voting rights, we want economic rights, we want uh, the same 
Yes, what rate of return? But like the law of return? Well, I, I would put it on as sort of like last, just simply <laughs> because it would it would move the process further. I mean, it's it, you know, if you just set your goals too high, you might not get anything, and that's probably one of the problems that in the Palestinian leadership they don't get anything because they set their goals too high. So I would just go with that. Now, this is very sensitive in among the Israeli public. They don't like the ideas of seeing a second class citizen. They think that the reason why there is a second class citizen, it's because there are a lot of terrorists and hostile people living in the West Bank. So that is a justification. But if the, the discourse changed, and suddenly you hear Palestinians say, well, you know what? I, I, I'm ready to serve even to the IDF. I know it's a not popular way of thinking, and certainly in among Palestinians. I'm ready to just undertake in all the duties that the Israeli citizens have, and also I'll add the benefits of, of being a, a, an Israeli citizen, voting, etc. Might not go that far, but it certainly will push governments like Bibi Netanyahu to actually make more concessions right away, simply because he will not want to see that happen. So even from a strategic perspective, I think that that will be something that will be uh, interesting to do, uh, both on the short term and in the long term. Um, we are now at exactly uh, 1.59. Um, there is no class in this room uh, at 2 o'clock, so we don't have to leave right now. But um, we do have, uh, Rashid has a, f a flight to catch, not right away, but he has to eat. Um, okay. <laughs> Let's take one last question. Uh, okay. Is there any left? Talk about eating all the pizza. That's right. There is some? Okay. Um, yes, please. Um, I mean, if you guys are okay. Hungry, but probably. Okay, yes. <laughs> Thank you uh, for a really great talk today. Um, I'm curious, uh, in, your, in part of the book, you talk about the US being sort of this deceptive arbiter. I'm curious as to what, you, what your thoughts on who could be a more honest broker um, in the deal, um, and whoever that may be, would the United States actually accept that, given they are you know, the, the global hegemon of, of world politics? Thank you, Tamara. Um, well, you, you're, you're right. Uh, Tom probably has something to say about this, but let me just say two words. Um, you're probably right. Uh, it comes very hard to American diplomats. You've served this. I mean, you can say, you can speak about this yourself. Um, it comes, I've seen them suffer when they are told that the United States has been cut out of the loop. I was tasked with telling Dan Kurtzer and uh, Aaron David Miller that the PLO and Israel had gone behind the back of the United States and negotiated a security agreement. And they were two very unhappy men. Uh, the United States does not like being told that it's not indispensable. Uh, and if you say that and you're an American politician, you're dead meat. I mean, forget about it. You lose. You can't win an election. You can't be confirmed by Congress. If you don't say, we're number one, we have to be everywhere, we are everything, we are the world. If you don't say that, it's, you know, don't count. Um, but the United States is not the world, and it's not indispensable. And on this, in this issue, it's been more of a problem than it has been a solution to the problem. Uh, the problem with finding an alternative is, however, is not just going around this American desire to be there always in the middle um, for strategic and other reasons. Uh, it is finding an acceptable interlocutor. Now, when Israel had a different government back in the early 90s, um, the Norwegians were able to put themselves forward as a credible uh, interlocutor that could serve in this capacity, and they played a role. I argue in the book that they didn't do as great a job as they like to think they did, but they certainly played a role as a mediator. And the point was that they, a mediator has to be acceptable to both sides. Uh, Israel has been spoiled by having an American mediator that holds its hand, does exactly what it wants, and you know doesn't really do anything to put pressure on it on the Palestine issue. Uh, and you have to wean it away from that, I would argue, and show Israelis that they really have to accept someone else in the world, whether it's a European, whether I mean Turkey played that role with Syria. Uh, under a different government, though, under the Olmert government. He was willing to allow the Turks to mediate between Israel and Syria. They made a lot of progress before the Gaza War of 2008-2009, when the Turks recoiled, and that was the end of Turkey's role, because they, they became unacceptable to the Israeli side. Um, but I would argue that many, many countries could play this role, but uh, you'd have to have a different kind of Israeli side, frankly. Right. You first have to consider how you resolve the problem of the asymmetry of power. Whomever the interlocutor is. 
And unfortunately, there aren't a great number of eminent international figures at this historical moment. Um, Willie Brandt, at one point, when he was president of the Socialist International after his period as, as the president, as prime minister of Germany, West Germany then, is the sort of person you might want. Kofi Annan is probably the only figure, if Nelson Mandela were 25 years younger, but there are very few figures of, of stature. See, it doesn't have to be a country. It has. It, it could be. A, it could be a person. Assuming you're going to have these collective negotiations, as opposed to what we were talking about most recently, uh, which is individual Palestinians. Of course, it would have to be coordinated, making making claims. The Israelis to to move in that direction to grant rights to individual Palestinians, particularly participation in elections. But the Israelis would have to be assured that they control the security services and the army. Is there any precedent for that? Well, there is a precedent I can, I can think of. It's a very rough analogy. When the Sandinistas were defeated to their surprise, and to many other, the surprise of many other people in the election of 1990, I believe was the year. They were reluctant to give up power, particularly because they expected that the conservative government in Nicaragua would assume power, backed by the United States, might engage in recriminalizing their behavior, reprisal, retaliation. And so they insisted on the continuing, they, they insisted that the Sandinista Comandante, who had been professionalizing the Nicaraguan armed forces, remain as the general of the Nicaraguan army. And he did, uh, the brother of Daniel Ortega, and a much better man than Daniel Ortega. And uh, they coexisted, but, he coexisted perfectly well with the conservative prime minister and finished the process of professionalizing the armed forces. But of course, that was transitional. But we're talking about something that would be made more permanent. That is, there would be permanent guarantees that the Jewish part of the population would continue to dominate the armed forces and the security services. So obviously you have a very complicated constitutional arrangement. Nothing is forever. But that would be an, an essential element in, in that. And I suppose then you would have to work out mutual vetoes. And you have, you have examples of this, a, a number of examples around the world where the minority or a, a, an identifiable part of the electorate has the power of veto either over all <coughs> legislation or over any legislation which impacts on their group. And that can force, particularly if it's over all legislation, that can force cooperation because the, the majority, and, that, and initially there would be a, still be a Jewish majority, but it might, it might pass in the end, although the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox are producing as many children as the Arab population is producing. So the more now. More now. So the long-term demographics are no longer clear. It used to be said that the Arabs would just produce more children, eventually they'll be the majority. That's not clear any longer, which is probably a good thing in certain respects. So it would be very complicated, it would be very unusual, but lawyers can think of ways of, of providing reassurances. But some Israelis would say, but nothing is forever, and anyway, these are just, these are legal reassurances, but where is the change in heart? Where is the cultural change? Where is the difference in mindset? And that's what, um, it, it would take a generation or two. Different textbooks, integrated schools, national service for all. If there were a desire, you and I could sit down, or she and I could sit down, Micheline would be our advisor. <laughs> And you could be the interlocutor. 
And we, you can come up with formulas, but it, it, as you point out, it's very complicated. But it's, it's not impossible to conceive. What's difficult to conceive is how to get to the point where people would agree to explore that possibility, and we're not there yet. Stan, uh, give you an example a little closer to home, which is the way in which Lebanon is organized. I was thinking Lebanon. And by that, I don't actually mean the sectarian uh, organization of political positions or the sectarian organization of the Lebanese parliament, but the um, fact that the commander-in-chief of the army has to be a Maronite, and the, and the head of the Sufi General, the Amin Arab, has to be a Maronite. I mean, by convention, and then some of it by law, um, Maronites are now a minority uh, in Lebanon, but that, that has been maintained. Nobody's questioned. So, yeah, you, you know, you have to have a quid pro quo, of course. Each of these things that has to be. Um, I saw a hand up there. Where, uh, Tamara, please. I'd like to come back to the question of the role of the U.S. as mediator. Um, bounce around some alternatives. The U.S. as mediator. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tamara. Yeah, well, if you could you. stand up. I'm sorry. just passing pizza around. Right. The role of the U.S. as mediator. Um, we've been messing around some alternative mediators. Mm -hmm. And part of this seems to be premised on the notion that there's some kind of I agree with everything you said. Um, it is possible to have a negotiation with an is asymmetrical. I don't think as asymmetrical as it is today. I think the Palestinians have to change the balance of forces before they can go to the table of credit. I don't think a divided Palestinian national movement that is bankrupt of ideas and has no idea how to respond to the kind of issues that Micheline was talking about, the kind of points of time, they have no ideas. I mean, uh, the conference I was at just recently, someone from the PA spoke. He, his, it was insipid, it was vacuous. He had nothing to say. The guy from Hamas who spoke made more sense, and imagine that, than the guy from the PA. So you, you, you have to change the balance of forces. And the first thing you have to do is unify your ranks, have to decide what you want. What is the Palestinian objective in this, and how do you get there? And then you have to put incentives and disincentives for the other side, which almost don't exist today. I mean, what are the disincentives for Israel for continuing the status quo? I can't think of very few besides BDS and a couple other things. And that's not the PA or the Palestinian people that are doing that. It's, it's Palestinian civil society that initiated it, but it's people here and people especially in Europe. So yeah, you, I think you have to change the asymmetry somewhat. Uh, but I agree with you. Were it to be seen as, as in the US national interest to act in an even-handed manner, then uh, a, a, a somewhat biased mediator could well play a, 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 a positive role in that because it's in its national interest, it might lean on the stronger party. Now, if you read the book, you'll see that, uh, and, and you can go into the documents that are now out, the Foreign Relations of the United States, relevant Foreign Relations of the United States volume, talks about Nixon telling Rogers at the beginning of his presidential term in 69, uh, the United States has to be even-handed. There are strategic reasons why we have to act in an even-handed fashion. Over time, the United States ceased to see that that was strategically imperative, okay? When and if they do, then I agree with you. Uh, there was a moment towards the middle of the Iraq war when you had senior American military officials, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and so on, coming out and saying, it's in our national interest to be more even-handed because people all over this region are, 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 are hostile to the United States and are shooting at our soldiers because of Palestine. But when you had generals and admirals dripping with, me with medals from here to here, dripping with braid, saying that, it had an impact. It, the occupation mercifully has ended. Our troops are out of uh, Iraq, and you don't hear those voices from the military anymore. Uh, so I'm not saying we should have another land war in Asia, so <laughs> American generals can tell us we have to be even-handed on Palestine. 
I hope that it would be both domestically and strategically in our national interest and in the political interest of you know American politicians to be more even-handed. But I agree with you. If that were the case, it would it would it could conceivably. Folks, it is now. 2.13, and this has been a really robust discussion, um, uh, punctuated with bites of pizza. And uh, again, our apologies from the Center for Middle East Studies for the um, pizza fiasco, the, the, the late and cold pizza. These things do happen, but um, uh, thanks so much for coming, for staying this long. I mean, this I think this is a testament, by the way, and I see some faces who were there last night as well. So... Some of us have now um, feasted, to continue that metaphor, on um, a lot of food for thought that Rashid uh, Khalidi has provided for us over the last 24 hours. We deeply appreciate... Indeed. Um, and we... Um, that's right. I mean, that's why we designed uh, the dialogue today precisely in this way, to, uh, to mix it up and to, uh, to see um, Rashid... Uh, how you might respond to to, to some feedback, and um, and and to have this kind of critical dialogue, um, we deeply appreciate Rashid's time. I do uh, encourage everyone to pick up uh, a copy of Rashid's uh, new book that we've been discussing today, Brokers of Deceit. There are copies here, and you can find them in the campus bookstore. Some of Rashid's previous books are also available. And um, I think Rashid would be happy to, you know, he's not going anywhere. He's, he's eating pizza and signing books. So if you want to informally chat with Rashid um, in the coming uh, minutes, uh, please feel free to. And thanks again for sticking around.